when you want to make something invisible to uh, get rid of the shadow. Mm. Uh, and I make the analogy with a rock in a stream. So when water flows past the rock in a stream, it, it f flows smoothly around it. Downstream, you can't tell, tell that the rock is there because the water is flowing smoothly again. Now, light doesn't flow like water, um, but you, you want to make it do so, so that there's no shadow downstream of the object, and therefore the object, as far as you're concerned, downstream is, is invisible. And that's the challenge for the materials. Um, and the new materials we use are called metamaterials. They have properties, so you wrap a cloak made of these metamaterials around the object you want to hide. It's, it's a fairly thick cloak, it's not thin, um, and you grade the properties of the material so that it captures the light, it guides it around uh, the object and then releases it on the far side as if it had passed straight through the object. Just like a skier going around a tree uh, and continues in a straight line, but you've made a chicane and avoided the tree, you've made the tree invisible as far as the ski skier is concerned. <laughs> Uh, this has been done, it's been done twice, once in Berkeley we on a very microscopic scale, so uh, on a few thousands of a metre. <laughs> um, but it's also been done on a larger scale by a group in Birmingham who've used materials, uh, actually not metamaterials, but materials from nature which by accident have just the right properties for their particular case. Uh, and those those cloaks made in Birmingham are about oh ten centimeters across, um, and they hide objects of similar size. So it has been realised for, for visible light. In as a theorist, I can say, oh no, it's it's easy. All you have to do <laughs> is find a tame experimentalist who can do this. Uh, certainly microwaves, there's, there's no limit uh, other than the money that you're willing to spend. So if you want to hide something from uh, radar waves, you can easily hide something the size of a tank. That's not a problem. Um, for optical cloaks, the materials are very, very expensive to fabricate. <laughs> and so expense would certainly stop you cloaking anything much bigger than a few centimetres. I'm sure the military are thinking about applications and they, they're very welcome to do that. Um, I'm more interested in the commercial applications because I think they'll be far more extensive and spread the word about these new materials more effectively. The challenge that uh, is taken up is, is most people are trying to do something not as complicated as making a cloak. That's quite a complex thing, so the simple things will get done first. Uh, and what we're doing with the new materials is replacing existing devices with, with devices that can be made with these mass materials in more cheaply uh, and more effectively. Such as? Such as uh, satellite communications receivers. Um, you may be familiar with these dishes that are about 30 centimetres in, in diameter that uh, reporters perhaps ca carry when they're in remote locations and they can use their, their telephones uh, by communicating with a satellite. Uh, the dishes uh, are quite big, they're heavy, they have to be steerable because they have to track the satellite and that takes electrical power, quite a lot of power. If you replace those with metamaterials, th those replacements are, are static devices. Uh, they're quite light. Um, they're actually cheaper, I believe, than the satellite dishes and they consume very little power because they're not moving any mechanical parts so you can plug them into the U UHB port of your, your laptop. Um, so hopefully, well the company which is making those is called Kymeta and uh, I think their capitalization now is, is about a billion dollars so, so they're, they're actually making progress in the market.
Well, I think the first thing to say is what, what's not a perfect lens. <laughs> um, a long time ago, a man called Abbe introduced something called the Abbe limit, which is how small an object you can see uh, with, with light and using ordinary lenses. And uh, his rule was that you can't see anything much smaller than about half the wavelength of light. And that's about typically half a micron. If you use shorter wavelengths, then you can see smaller things. But there's a limit to how far you can go, because if you use too short wavelengths, you, you can't uh, find lenses to, to focus them. So we, we're stuck in, with conventional, uh, conventional technology in, in, in how small a thing we can see. And that's a serious problem because the modern age is very much into nanotechnology, particularly in biology, where you want to look inside uh, a human cell, maybe, and uh, the contents of that cell, uh, their structure is on the nanoscale, not the microscale. And so conventional microscopes just can't help you uh, unless you have some of these very clever techniques that people like Stefan Hell have been developing. So that's that's why lenses are not perfect, there's the Abbe limit. But it isn't an absolute limit of physics, it's a limit of the way you design the lens. Fifty years ago, a Russian scientist called Veselago um, suggested that we look at some very strange materials. He didn't have any of these materials, but he said, what if we did have a material with something called a negative refractive index? Refractive index measures the strength of how much the material could bend light. And if it goes negative, then something very odd happens, and he set out all these various things. And one of the things he said was that you can actually use this material to focus light in a very strange way. And most lenses, um, all lenses that we typically know, uh, are, are curved. And that's what lens means, lenticular, it means it's curved. Uh, his lens wasn't curved, it was flat, and still you could focus light um, using this property of negative refraction. And that was fine, except that nobody knew the material with the negative refractive index. And that's where our new materials came into the story, because they could be used to make a material with a negative refractive index. And this, this lens was built, but then I asked the question, well, does it suffer from the Abbe limit? Very different from the lens which Abbe assumed. And I sat down one day and I did the theoretical calculation, which wasn't hard, it's just that nobody had done it before, and I asked, how does this lens resolve? And the answer was, no limit. Yes. Like a virus? Or? Theoretically. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the qualification is providing you make it perfectly. <laughs> and, and there's the rub. But that uh, conclusion was because of the, this very well-known law by Abbe, was very, very controversial. And it was fought uh, very hard by some people who just wouldn't accept that uh, the result could be true. Uh, but that battle was eventually won. And I think the result is stronger because, it's, if you can say, it's had a test of fire with people throwing every possible argument at it and saying, and, and these arguments have been answered one by one, and the theory is correct. The difficulty is, is making it because these materials are not easy to produce, but people have made these materials, and they've shown that uh, you can make a lens which uh, it's obviously not perfect because the materials aren't perfect, but it's much, much better in an ordinary lens by a factor of, I think now they've got a factor of 10 better than ordinary resolution. Um, first using a microwave lens and now they're using optical lenses as well. Well, what people are doing at the moment is, is not making a microscope out of it. Well, people are trying to, but they haven't done that yet. What they're trying to do is a simpler challenge, which is to focus light to a very fine point. And why would you want to do that? Well, for some experiments, you need the photons to be very, very concentrated. Otherwise, they have no effect. For example, if you want photons to bump into one another, you've got to put them very, very close together. Otherwise, they just don't see one another. Um, and 
you, you can do that, but it, with conventional ideas, it takes a very powerful laser to produce a very strong beam in the first instance, and, and then you focus it down to what an ordinary lens will do, which is like a square micrometer or something. Um, and that takes a very powerful laser, and it's an expensive experiment. Now imagine that you could take uh, a beam, and instead of focusing it down to a square micron, you focus it down to a square nanometer. That's a thousand times in length and a million times in area. So you'd only need a millionth of the power that you would for the worst focusing if you could focus so well. You could have a much greater density. So the whole thing scales by a factor of a million and you can get these very, very high densities of photons to do all sorts of things like photons talking to one another, uh, detecting single molecules and so on, um, much more cheaply uh, and effectively. And people can do that now, they've achieved that. Uh, and that's the focus of my current research and what I'll be talking about at this conference uh, tomorrow, how we can design structures, metamaterials, which will capture light and push it down to, to the nanoscale. Uh, several reasons. First, uh, if, if, if a rule has been around for a long time and has uh, stood the test of time, of course nobody had broken that rule <laughs> in all the several hundred years that it had been around, um, then there's a, a natural prejudice that you say, Who, who's this crazy guy? And I didn't even work in optics at that time. I, I brought my skills from, from another field, and that was my strength in that I, I didn't have this hardwired idea that this law has to be true. And, and the second thing was that the, the mathematics, although not complicated, was brought from another field. It's very familiar in, in electron physics, multiple scattering theory and so on. Uh, but it wasn't widely known in the optics community, so some people thought it's strange mathematics, there must be something wrong with it. And it is true, there were some subtleties in it that uh, perhaps weren't quite obvious. Um, um, you know, sometimes you can have results in mathematics and uh, they, they look straightforward, and then when you pick away at them, there's some singularity in there or whatever that, that, that goes wrong, and people were worried by, the, by that as well. No, I don't. I, I'm a very conservative person myself, and, and I'm all in favour of conservatism. The advantage of conservatism is that there's no end of uh, wacky ideas going around, and the secret is to pick which wacky idea uh, you're going to follow and which, which, is, which uh, is going to be uh, productive. So uh, a certain conservatism and uh, almost rejecting some ideas out of hand because your intuition says if I go down there I'm going to end up in a deep hole uh, is, is, is the way we proceed. You, you cannot look at every uh, strange idea and analyse it in profound detail because you'd waste your life on useless calculations. So intu intuition and conservatism, <laughs> having useful <laughs> role to play in science. So, uh, yes, by all means be imaginative and innovate, but uh, do get it under control. I think, you, you, again, it's a question of intuition. Uh, when you have an idea, um, you, you have to decide whether that idea is merely interesting or whether it's likely to be profound. And there's no fixed rule for that other than experience. Um, so what I mean by a profound idea is an idea which will lead on to other things, which will provide a spur to other people to add to it and elaborate it and do new things. And I think this field of metamaterials, which has uh, produced so many materials that we didn't have before, provides lots of opportunities for the young people to innovate. When a new idea comes into science, um, for it to be adopted in engineering, you, you, you really need the old engineers to die and the young people to come along. <laughs> That's a cruel conclusion, but it's true. <laughs>